Hi, I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I am the editor in chief and VP of streaming media. And boy, do we have a great panel for you here talking about niche or niche services and their role in the OTT universe. This is our seventh virtual event. We just spent the last hour talking all about the virtues and drawbacks of in-person and virtual and hybrid events. And uh, we're thrilled that we're going to be back in person. At least that's the plan for Streaming Media East in May, May 24th and 25th in Boston. And on May, Monday, May 23rd, we'll be holding the Content Delivery Summit in person for the first time in a few years as well. So we hope some of you can join us for that. But it's been a great week of virtual panels and presentations. And we'll wrap things up tomorrow with a workshop called The Best Streaming Gear and How to Use It. Thanks so much for being here and for joining us. Uh, if you're here, you're entered into a drawing to win an Amazon gift card. We'll be announcing the winner at the end of the hour, and you'll receive an email early next week letting you know how to collect that if you won. I'd like to thank our sponsors for the entire week, Bird Dog and Harmonic, and we've got brief video messages from each of them right now. I would also like to thank the sponsor of this panel, Bitmovin, and Bitmovin's Igor Oropper will be joining the panel when we start talking about niche services in just a moment. Before that, though, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have questions for our panel, please put them in the Q&A. You can press the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. It's a lot easier for me and our moderator to keep track of them if they're there than if they are coming in the chat. Finally, uh, we do have transcripts turned on. If you want to turn them off, you can go to the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window and click on that and then select disable transcript. So I'd like to welcome our moderator, Chris Paff from Chris Paff Tech, Tech Media. Hello, Chris. How are you? I'm very well, Eric. Good to see you again. You as well. It seems like it was only yesterday, but it was actually Tuesday. <laughs> it was. But uh, oh. if, if it's Tuesday, you'd still be here. And Thursday, you're here because this is where you need to be. Exactly. If you're interested in uh, the burgeoning OTT industry. Exactly. So I'm just going to let you take it away because we've got a lot to cover. We do. And we have an all star panel and a large one. Uh, but, um, you know, when we talk about large panels, we're uh, talking actually about niche services. Uh, again, uh, if you're not here for from small things, how niche services can find mainstream success, just stay here because it's a great panel. I'm going to welcome uh, our panelists, uh, and they'll then give you a brief description of what they do in their companies. First, let's start with Mark DiLorenzo. He is the CEO and founder of Together. He joins us from Santa Monica. Welcome, Mark. Hey, Chris. How are you? Great. Uh, great to see you. Uh, Deshauna Spencer, uh, who is the CEO founder of Quelly TV, she joins us from Washington, D.C. Welcome, Deshauna. Thanks for having me. Great. And uh, we also have Paul Erickson. Uh, Paul is an analyst and uh, actually his official title is Director of Research. We're very lucky to have him. He's with Parks Associates. Welcome, Paul. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, we have Damien Reverie, uh, who generally needs no introduction, but I will introduce him. He's the CEO and founder of Reverie. He joins us from L.A., and he's in his studio right now. Hey, Damien, how are you? Hi, Chris. Great to be here. Uh, all the way from Mumbai, we have, and we're really thrilled, and thank you to Paul Schneider uh, for this incredible get. We have the founder and CEO of AHA, AHA India's Ajit Thacker. Welcome to you, Ajit. Hi. Hi, Chris. Good evening. It's Good very morning. Very, very late there in the evening. It's, uh, what is it, 11.36 or something. So uh, thanks for staying up late. Uh, last but not least, the aforementioned sponsor of this panel uh, is Igor Oropper. He's the VP of Solutions at Bitmovin for anyone 
uh, who's in this industry, particularly if you read streaming media, you know all about BitMove and welcome Igor. He joins us today from Denver. Everyone, pleasure to be here. And just quickly, if you can, and we'll do round robin, just give a brief description for those who don't know of what you do. Mark, let's start with you. Uh, sure. Together uh, is an interactive live stream music service where fans can watch musical performances uh, live and then get the chance to participate, to come on screen, on video, meet their musical heroes, uh, speak to them and each other uh, face to face. So in addition to being a programming service, we're also a community of music lovers that connects artists with their fans. Great. Thanks. And Deshauna, please uh, give us a description of what you do with Quelly TV. Sure. So Quelly TV, we are a streaming service that has live and on-demand programming that celebrates Black stories, as well as amplifies Black storytellers from across the globe. Great. And uh, Paul, uh, give us a description of what you're doing with uh, Parks. Sure. So I'm a research director for our entertainment and consumer electronics uh, research uh, portions of our research, uh, market research business. Uh, Parks Associates is a market research firm and consultancy uh, that's been in business for over 36 years. And uh, one of the big things we do is a 10,000 person uh, survey of U.S. broadband households every quarter. And uh, we like to keep very, very up to date on the pulse of the U.S. broadband consumer. Great. Thanks for being here. Damien, give us an overview of Reverie. Yes, hi, I'm the CEO and one of the four fabulous co-founders of Reverie, which is now the world's largest LGBTQ global streaming network across FAST, AVOD, and SVOD platforms anywhere in the world. Great, thanks. And Ajit, give us a, a little uh, brief synopsis of what you do at AHA. Hey, uh, so AHA is a local language uh, OTT player. Uh, we have started our journey two years back uh, in Telugu language, which is one of the languages in the and between two states in the south of the country. And uh, we have just last week launched our second uh, language, which is Tamil. And uh, one of the unique propositions of AHA is that we've not merged all the languages on one platform. In each of the languages, you can experience AHA as 100% local in that language. Great, thanks for that. And Igor, give, again, um, so many people know what you do, but for those who don't, uh, tell us what you do uh, at Bitmovin. Sure, happy to. Uh, so uh, what I do at Bitmovin is I, I help our customers to understand our products, to get our products implemented so that they can launch really great video services. Uh, what does Bitmovin do? We make great tools uh, to help you all un launch those uh, uh, video streaming services, an encoder, a player, and an analytics service. It's not everything you need, but it's uh, some of the biggest things that you need in order to get your service launched. So happy to be here and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Great overview. Thanks for that. Let's start with you, Paul. I know you have a slide that you want to show, and I think this is a good table setter uh, for this discussion. So why don't you go ahead and do that, Paul? Okay, let's take it away. Can you see it okay? Yes, I can. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks for that setup, Chris. And I thought it would help frame today's discussion by first taking a focused look at the OTT market environment within which niche services are operating today, based on Parks Associates survey data of 10,000 U.S. broadband households. And so right now, 80% of U.S. broadband households have at least one OTT subscription, <clears throat> and nearly half, 49%, have four or more subscriptions. And so competition is at an all-time high, but subscription growth is starting to slow down or has been slowing down. And consumers, they're facing subscription overload, especially as they have a finite amount of time and budget to spend on streaming, particularly as they spend less time at home in this post-pandemic environment. So consumers are getting more intentional and more discriminating in what services are going to be in that stack of must-subscribe services every month. And also the inherent ease of leaving and switching OTT services has churned at an all-time high, 45% in Q3 2021, uh, which is up from only 40% at the same time uh, the prior year in 2020. And so finding ways to keep subscribers engaged and retaining them are as important as ever. And one overarching need felt by a lot of today's consumers is for simplicity. And consumers want to decrease the amount of multiplicity and complication and one way they're doing so is by uh, leaning into the chances to take advantage of variety, and some iterations of which are delivered via bundling and aggregation. 
And so to kind of explain this second uh, chart here, you see on the right in this slide, viewers dedicate an average of 70% of their viewing to services with a broad variety of content. And over one third of viewers dedicate over three fourths of their time to services with varied content. And so the big three OTT services and their closest competitors, they leverage this by featuring a variety of content across genres. Now niche services can also leverage the same effect, uh, most frequently via bundling deals that deliver a varied combination of content to consumers or by being included in an aggregation platform such as a BMVPD or fast service that is similarly delivering a package of variety. And so the takeaway there is having access to variety matters to the consumer, uh, whether that's coming via their, their creation of their own bundle or that's coming via an aggregation or BMVPD or fast service. And so <clears throat> increasingly consumers, they're creating their own bundles, as I said. And one thing to note is that the super aggregation that's increasingly the norm in the latest user experiences, for example, Google TV, uh, the latest iterations of Samsung Tizen, LG WebOS, and several others, it brings a content first experience to the consumer and it attempts to bring together that self bundling uh, proposition into a less fragmented unified experience, or that's the hopeful goal. And so the need to dive in and out of individual apps, such as going to a niche content app is going to decrease. And so super aggregations, hopeful goal in principle is to democratize personalization and discovery at the UX level and niche services potentially can benefit. We will see over the near future how well these streaming platform owners succeed in delivering this vision. So with that brief, fast, and focused Thanks, overview Paul. of the OTT market, I'll hand the baton back to you, Chris. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, really, really great uh, sort of table setting. And I, I really appreciate uh, you uh, and your generosity and your team's generosity in sharing that. Uh, let's dive into the first question I have, and, and uh, I want to address this first to to you mark so where's the market for niche ott long term will a thousand flowers bloom and turn into a million flowers or will larger entities buy up the niche players what's your take on that yeah i mean i, I think consolidation is is inevitable to to a certain degree and I, I think you know for us i could see that uh being either horizontal or vertical uh, you know obviously um are the format that we have with interactivity works in other niches of music that we don't currently serve. It also works in other content verticals. So those could be ways that that we could expand. Uh, but equally, uh, you know, a larger player put in would who might want to put together a portfolio of niche channels uh, could see that as a as a consolidation opportunity. Um, but within our our vertical of music, uh, the music ecosystem, you know, we're we're very focused on this uh, niche of guitar based music. Uh, crossing genres of rock and blues and, and country. And uh, there's a whole ecosystem there, I think, of, of players that would like to have uh, access to what we have, which is this unique interactive relationship where they're actually in the consumer's living room. So if you think about um, audio services that don't have a video strategy or uh, music retailers or musical instrument manufacturers, um, all of those would be logical strategic partners for us who would want to have access uh, to our audience. So those would probably start as business development relationships, but those those could be consolidation opportunities vertically for us as well. Yeah, Deshauna, how about you? What's your, how, how do you view view that, that in, in terms of where we are uh, with, with both the sizing of the market and also the opportunities, wh whether it's consolidation or, or just uh, growth in general? That's a good question. Uh, it's something I think about quite a bit, right? The big boys are definitely consolidating. I've even had some conversations recently, uh, sort of approached me about potential merger and just literally just this week. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, I think long-term, I think merging companies, I think it's really important for us as a niche market. I think what's really important for us is making sure that we're uh, merging with the, the, the right actors, right? Um, that can really benefit from what we're doing that doesn't make us a notch in their belt. I think when you're a niche market, the reason that we're so successful at what we're doing is because we know our customers, we know how to reach them. And sometimes if you sort of become an entity under a bigger umbrella, um, you get lost in the shuffle. And so I think that when it comes to consolidation, we should just be mindful, at least I would be mindful as far as like who is the right partner for us in, in the long term. And that's something I do think about. And it's a great problem to have uh, that way. And, and Damien, um, I, I'll just sort of tee this up for you. I believe you're uh, raising a Series A round now. What's your uh, sort of take <laughs> on consolidation and, and where the market is vis-a-vis -vis niche uh, services? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And thank you. Yes, we did just recently open our Series A and looking for a lead investor right now um, is always fun. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with the last two folks. I think that, you know, our exit strategy at Reverie has always been that we will, the assumption is that we will get consolidated and scooped up into a bigger machine. And to Deshauna's point, it's making sure that that is the right partner that you decide to merge with or consolidate into that really understands the community that you're addressing. Um, and I, and, and, you know, agreeing with Mark too, community comes first at the end of the day, that's our consumer. So we don't want to do anything that could jeopardize the consumer experience, but then also making sure that, um, you know, the consumer is first in mind when it comes to whether it's content creation, distribution, or even like something big like consolidation. Yeah. And, and Ajit, what's, how, how do you view this? Because of course, you're uh, adding, uh, you just added, I believe, uh, Tamil uh, uh, last week. So you're growing, um, you know, is, is there a consolidation play for you? And, and you know, what's your take on this? I think a slightly different take, probably also because uh, in Asia, we are following the trends and we'll probably catch up soon. Uh, but before I talk about uh, uh, India, I think uh, fundamentally, I believe growing up uh, watching television, television viewership was driven by the most dominant viewer in the house and kind of it led to lack of variety. I think OTT fundamentally will behave differently. I think business consolidation will happen. But uh, from a viewer perspective, I think the OTT is such a personalized medium that there will always be demand for very, what we call niche services. In fact, I think an OTT niche is the new mass. And I keep telling this to all the people who asked us, why didn't we do four languages together? Uh, coming to India, it's uh, fascinating. Paul, I love the data and uh, you know I can see that three years from now. Uh, but today we are at about 450 million uh, uh, video viewers online but of which uh, the number today for SWOT unbundled services is about 40 to 42. But two years ago, it was 10 million. So it's grown from 10 to 25 to 40. And I think uh, we'll probably see uh, probably 100, 150 million SWOT unbundled viewers. And uh, we, when we launched uh, two years back, all the big players were there, the broadcaster backed OTTs, the big guys and the international OTTs, they were all there in Telugu. And the Telugu youth were watching everything. They were watching Korean, they were watching Hollywood, they were watching you know, Spanish, they were watching Hindi, they were watching everything, but they didn't, didn't have much of their own content. And to that 15 to 34 year old male female, we went and we said, hey, listen, this is AHA, it's 100% Telugu. And we didn't just go and give them, uh, so all of the platforms were launching about 30 to 40 content pieces in a year, but it was split across eight languages. So in one language, those kids got four. We went and gave them 52 shows stroke films in one year, one every week, only in Telugu. And when we went back to research a year later, they said, yeah, I love that app. They love Netflix and I like that, but AHA is my app. So, yeah. so yeah. I think, yeah. so we turned a niche into a mass opportunity and I think the same opportunity exists for music. I would love to get something like together here with different instruments uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I think consolidation will happen because business will necessitate that. The big guys will want to, will have the budgets to make bigger, better content, but the need for personalized and very segregated content is not going to go away anytime soon, anywhere in the world. Yeah, and you know, and it's interesting because I look at at uh, what you mentioned with respect to the size of the opportunity, and that's independent of any mega mega hit per se. Uh, which gets to my next question. Um, last year, Matt Creasy of Banerjee was quoted in the Hollywood Reporter saying that niche and regional SVOD players such as Acorn TV, Via Play, and RTLs TV Now uh, are quote more vital to us than Netflix unquote. Um, do you think that that's where producers and, and where you might be heading to the smaller loyal subscribers of such services, which you actually represent? But Mark, let's start with you on that one. Yeah, I mean, we have we think of um, musicians, artists, creators, as opposed to producers. But I think the concept is the same. And, and for those for those musicians, if they want to be on a video service, there there is no equivalent paid service like a like a Netflix there's really, you know, just the open platforms like Twitch or, or like Facebook. And, and one of the things that our artists actually 
love about together is that we're not Twitch and we're not Facebook um, because they don't really want to be uh, putting their content out there on those platforms where it doesn't monetize and, and where they're out there with a lot of, frankly, lower quality content. So there's real value to them in being part of this, you know, sort of very carefully curated, uh, smaller curated offering inside this, this walled garden, um, because it's, it's sort of a signal to their, to their fans that this is, uh, it's a brand safe environment. They see the other artists who are on there. They want to be a part of that. And also because we are behind a paywall, um, our audience is, is a completely troll free zone. It's, it's a very, um, passionate community of, of music lovers who really appreciate the artists. So I think for both those reasons, um, we found that the artists really have gravitated towards us as a smaller niche service, as opposed to something that is, you know, more the 800 pound gorilla in the marketplace for sure. Yeah. And Damien's raised his hand. So Damien, you're extremely well differentiated. Do you find producers coming to you uh, or, or people who talk to you about maybe launching a subsidiary? What's your take since you, you've been now? Uh, how, how old is Reverie now? Remind me. We're in our sixth year, actually. Um, well, I think you're the old man on the block here. I think Quelly's <laughs> only five years old, right? Right, right Tashana? Yeah, right? five years. Uh, together is a year old. And yeah. AHA is how old? Ajit. Yes. Two years. So we have two pandemic baby uh, services. We got a five-year-old and then we got a bratty six-year-old. Uh, but no, seriously, um, you're, I, I mean, because I'm curious now because you're, you're about to hit another, you know, level here. Yeah. Are producers coming to you? Uh, on, I mean, how does it, what, what sort of the temperature on that side? Yeah, so there's one thing I just wanted to touch on that Mark said that is super important for all niche services, and I'm sure even Deshana will agree with this too. You know, the fact that we are all curated services uh, means a lot, not just to the producers and the content creators, because there's a certain level of like exclusivity or elite, uh, you know, status when you have your content on, I'm sure any of these services that are walled, but more importantly, ones that are working like us with brands, big brands like McDonald's, Diesel, Lexus, who are constantly uh, influxing us with either branded content, originals, long form, or even just leveraging our ad inventory now across all of our networks that we control. The biggest problem is when you want to target a $1.1 trillion yearly LGBTQ GDP, that's the disposable income of our community coming off the last census in 2020. If you're trying to do that in places like social media, like Facebook, buying paid ads on Facebook or Google, you would be a Astounded at the amount of trolls, to Mark's point, and the amount of labor it takes to curate those comments. Whereas when you come to one of these differentiated services that is curated and gardened, you actually have direct contact with the exact community that you are trying to hit in a, with a much higher ROI. Yeah. And Deshauna, uh, so do you agree with Damien? Uh, let's get your take here. I'm doing 10%. <laughs> so to the point that you know a lot of times we're deleting very racist comments that we receive from people they see an ad about our service and one of the things we mentioned to people is that yeah we are black streaming service but we're for everyone where the, the platform is not going to shut down if someone who doesn't like me you know log on it's not going to the computer's not going to shut off so people think that we're segregating ourselves so like what Damien said our whole goal is really creating a, a safe space for our customers, where they don't feel like they're watching Black trauma, Black suffering. Uh, they know they can they're getting a carefully curated content on our platform that really displays Black love, black love and Black excellence. Um, and also, they don't have to worry about other people coming in and saying things that is counterintuitive to what our mission is. So Damien's 110% correct. I mean, even the people who do make comments on our platform, uh, about films, even if the film was okay because they know as a creator and like, well, you know, I don't want to hurt this creator's feelings, but this is how, this is my opinion about it. It's a very community-based type of conversation versus, you know, some of the vitriol we see like on Twitter mm -hmm. or, or Facebook. Yeah, and well, but that's interesting because of course, you know, you've, you've got library content, uh, you know, I'm sure there, there's, there's talk about originals. And let's go to you, Ajit, because of course, you know, you're in in uh, this this very very interesting position where I would think uh, you would get 
you know, more producers interested in you, whether it's adding a language like uh, Tamil recently, or just uh, the fact that you've seen this um, massive spike and you, oh, by the way, happen to uh, be in uh, the second most populous country in the world. So. Absolutely. So just to give you a perspective before uh, AHA launched uh, from the Hyderabad, which is where the capital city for the Telugu states is, uh, there would have been maybe two or three producers who are invited to make content for the big platforms because they all ran out of Mumbai. Today, uh, not just for AHA, but almost everybody has come to Hyderabad. And now they're going to Chennai, which is where the capital city for Tamil Nadu is. And uh, I would say at this point of time, there are about 150 producers creating content for OTT out of Hyderabad, which was probably two or three, uh, you know, a few years back. So I think uh, it, it's giving uh, birth to a whole gen new generation of content creators, uh, whether it's a language niche or I can tell you talk about two other uh, niches, music and fashion. It was like relegated to the, you know, uh, shadows and the fringes uh, because of the general entertainment television. Television was all about mass entertainment, the dramas and soaps, and music was like literally like a side service, and there was almost no fashion. I mean, fashion TV was like just in the five star hotels. And today, the amount of creators that are there for fashion and music and the way it's growing, it wasn't possible before the what what you calling the niche OTT revolution uh, hit India. Yeah, let's let's stay stay with you, and because I want you and Mark to talk to this, since uh, you have some shared DNA. You and Mark, you both uh, at one time worked in the broader Fox uh, uh, universe, and you were with Star TV. So you know, let let's let's go back. I mean, would you have seen six, seven, eight years ago uh, this this kind of trajectory with respect to OTT, independent of a pandemic? Uh, did you see seed seedlings of that? I think it was inevitable. And uh, I think uh, the growth of OTT in India definitely is linked to the growth of 3G and 4G and the telecom services. And they've grown so rapidly. I think we have jumped from 2G to 5G. I think we right. blinked and 3G was done and that was 4G and now we are testing 5G. And uh, yeah. a large part of the country as and the mobile handsets have become more and more affordable. Uh, we at, at, Till the pandemic, actually, a large part of OTT viewership, probably 80%, uh, all was uh, restricted to mobile handsets. Of course, the pandemic has changed it. Now a lot more people have figured out a way to connect it to the smart TVs or make the TVs smart with the you know the sticks. Uh, so absolutely, it was coming. I think the growth of telecom and then the pandemic has just uh, you know propelled us from second gear to fourth gear overnight. Uh, yeah, it was almost and, coming because exactly. because television didn't cater to the wider audience. Television is catering to only one audience with soaps for a very, very long time. Yeah, thank you for that perspective. And uh, for those who are not familiar, yes, I mean, 4G was a huge, huge, huge step forward for India. I made a joke uh, because Ajit was the last person to join our green room. And I said, oh, he's probably on a motorcycle on bad 3G in Hyderabad. I didn't know he was in Mumbai today. Uh, but uh, but that's you know one of the underlying things that we take for granted. Mark, would you have seen you know this, uh, say, six, seven, eight years ago? Yeah, I would agree with Ajit that that it it was inevitable. But I but I do think um, what happened during the pandemic, ex like so many media trends, were just accelerated by the pandemic. But I but I think in particular for us, I think the the importance of community and and the failure of of social networks to to really deliver on what their initial promise was, which was the idea of community, and they actually wound up sort of fomenting you know quite the opposite of that. And so I think that was one of the biggest things that that um, uh, really got elevated in in, in terms of level of importance during the pandemic was the importance of of community. And and so I really think that was something that that was a good tailwind for us, which was the ability to form you know together as in a way really a, a it's, we are a, a a streaming service, a streaming network, but we're really a social network of people who are you know united by this this common passion that they have. Um, and, and the fact that they are able to also participate and they're, they're actually part of the content, they can come on screen in between the songs and meet the artists and, and meet each other. And so now, a, a year into this, these fans that we have on the service, they've all gotten to know each other by name and the artists know a lot of them by name. And so that uh, has proven to be very sticky. They don't leave because they may have shown up for the content, but they actually stayed for the community. So I think that... that um, 
uh, increased importance of community is something that really got highlighted uh, during the pandemic and accelerated. Yeah, uh, Damien, I want you to talk about this and also what you see as the mix for niche content that you've referred in the past to a tribrid model that you have. And I, I would think that that you've seen even in the last year, a, a, a tremendous growth in community uh, with Reverie. Oh yeah, I mean, especially COVID was an accelerant, I think for everyone that's on this panel, it shot our business into a whole new spotlight. And also everything going on socially in the last few years has created a big groundswell for the need for this content to really be seen and highlighted. Um, and with our leadership profile, you know, we are co-founded by two women of color, Leah and LaShawn and Chris, who's Hispanic, I'm non-binary. So like we represent, and LaShawn's also an army veteran. So we represent a ton of different communities, just respective of who those, um, you know, the four co-founders and leadership is. And that has really been a big, a big accelerant. Last year, we won McDonald's as a client. And the project that we did was a long form 90 minute variety show. We promised them something like 5 million views. We did 16 million in 60 days um, organically without anything um, purchased. You, because you had a billboard in Times Square. We had a billboard in Times Square and McDonald's put the four co co-founders on that billboard, uh, which was a real treat for me because I've never seen my face so big before, but it was showing their commitment to diversity and inclusion and especially the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, and I think that this is the big opportunity for brands to dive into niche markets, whether it's Quelly TV or Reverie TV, we're seeing this grow very rapidly. And the big part of, you know, our service right now is the fast channel market, because essentially they are the new cable operator of the future and the AVOD market. That's about 90% of our revenue um, that we're seeing. And we're just focused on scaling that out as fast grows into multiple territories. Yeah, which is which is uh, really a tre tremendous, and of course, you know, we have a, a mix here of AVOD and obviously premium SVOD, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the t the tech that each of you are using or seeing. But Igor, talk to us about you know what you're seeing from your side with Bitmovin, because of course, so much of what's happened uh, in OTT is really enabled by what you're doing, as well as obviously uh, the underlying um, uh, broadband networks, which um, uh, knock on wood, uh, have done an incredible job, particularly here in the US uh, during the pandemic. So, so give us sort of your take from the tech stack side. Sure, yeah, uh, happy to, you know, we've seen a lot of growth, especially in the last couple of years in the niche services, because there's just so many of them right there. They're genre specific, they're, they're promoting uh, communities like you guys are discussing. Uh, we see a lot of uh, fitness, a lot of e-learning, um, e-gaming, right? I mean, there's just all of these things are popping up and they're growing really quickly. And what we've realized is, you know, the, the tech for OTT streaming, it, it's pretty hard um, and it's getting easier. Uh, but, you know, if I go back 15 years ago, right, really, really hard, had a lot of standards. Uh, the tool sets were, you know, really limited uh, and people have these, you know, great ideas about second screen experiences, uh, about you know uh, how to how to run live events, how to uh, curate and surface pod libraries in you know new and interesting ways, and it was really really hard to do 15 years ago. And then it got a little easier and a little easier, but still there's this barrier of entry because you need to have technical capabilities on staff, and usually that's not the the big strength for a lot of these niche services, right? The strength is content, it's curation, it's production. <clears throat> and so, you know, we've been working really hard uh, to make the tech easier uh, to, you know, to do self-service signups, to integrate our technology with other tech providers and open source tools um, so that, you know, the great ideas can really come to light. Uh, and so that's been our mission. I, I would say that mission has accelerated over the last uh, couple of years, especially through the pandemic, because we have all these new services entering the market. And they're saying, well, we have to launch really quickly. We have to launch across many platforms. We have to launch with all these great features. Um, help, how do we do that? Uh, and so they're, you know, I think the tech ecosystem is still pretty small. Um, you know, we talked about consolidation earlier of content services. There's similar consolidation happening for the tools and technology industry that support these content services. Um, so it's getting easier. I'm, you know, really excited to be able to 
you know, to see niche services come to us and launch product really quickly without having to invest a lot into the technology itself. Yeah, thank you for for that overview. And uh, let, let's talk about the tech that you you uh, each of you, particularly on the channel side, have had to, to use. Um, and Mark, of course, you're using uh, for those who don't know WebRTC in a very novel way. Uh, what did you have to do to overcome the challenges to make that happen? Yeah, I mean, for for music live stream, you know, what what we didn't want to do was to just try to create a pale imitation of of the concert experience. Uh, we wanted to use technology to create an experience that you can't have in the physical world, which is this this interactivity uh, with with the artist and the ability to develop those those um, ongoing relationships. But um, we also needed to have high def audio and video so that the music performance part of the of these presentations could be done at the highest level of quality. So there was definitely a lot of hurdles to overcome uh, in in that respect because WebRTC is something that you know is used has. People have used it primarily for something like this, which is a, you know a conference call and and speech. So um, having the the ability to do it with a high quality presentation streaming from the artist, uh, being able to do it without having the consumer or the artist be able to download a, uh, having not be have to download a separate piece of software to be able to do it within browser or from a mobile device with a native app, uh, making it simple for the artist, making it simple for the users to to reduce friction. And it was, you know, kind of a, a big integration task because we're bringing together um, live streaming with this return path on the video, real-time messaging, cloud recording, and and kind of wrapping that all in a custom video player um, that can be delivered in, in any of these, you know, web or, or app environments. And so there was really, there was nothing out there uh, off the shelf that would do that. And that's why we had to, you know, write, write custom code around that. Um, but ultimately that's... Um, you know, we felt WebRTC was the best underlying protocol that it could be, uh, it was possible to deliver the quality level that we needed if we wrote custom code around it. Well, uh, thanks for that. And and please go check out what Mark's doing to, to understand more. And Deshauna, uh, talk about your tech challenges with, with Quali TV over the years. So uh, when we first launched Quali TV, we actually built it from scratch. Um, I didn't, not myself personally, I don't have a background in technology. I hired someone to do it. And I, it was like a, a lesson from what is Bootstrap, what is all these different technologies that I knew nothing about. Um, it took us two years to launch on the beta just because we brought on people who were well-intentioned, but just didn't know how to really build a streaming service. And so that's when I started to do some research and figured out there were a lot of different OTT partners, kind of like Igor said, we're really good with the content side, not so much with the tech side and finding partners that can do that. And so, um, to help us launch other beta, we did work with a particular partner and we're actually in the process of migrating over to a new OTT partner. So um, for me, it's just hiring the right teams that know how to deliver, whether it's a fast channel or even the play out for our fast channel. I mean, those, the deliveries sometimes are different. Like we're on Comcast, so we use one company for our Comcast and Cox delivery. We use another company for like a campaign game and Zumo. And so, um, that has been a challenge for me, and honestly, I didn't know a lot. I, I will say, Damien, we're a part of this uh, group that <laughs> I've learned a lot from this uh, mastermind group that we're a part of, and uh, it's really helped, helped me quite a bit to sort of understand some of those tech things that I didn't know about first going into it. That's, and by the way, that's that's great. You know, talk about community. Uh, you know, communities within community-based uh, services. So. Uh, so since you have just been name checked, Damien, what, what have been your challenges? And I know that you use a number of providers, I think uh, World Frequency and even Amagi. Um, and I remember your early days, what you know you were doing. Um, so, you know, talk talk about, you know, how you've, you know, crossed various hurdles uh, to get where you are. Yeah, it's interesting because like when we first started, we are a subscription product only when there wasn't really AVOD and FAST back in 2016. And we used right. what became Vimeo OTT um, and we were on them for a couple of years, but then in that process, we started to launch with Pluto TV in 2017 with our first big advertiser, Lexus. And we found that the product wasn't able to be able to scale into being a hybrid of AVOD and SVOD. Um, so we moved over to Dot Studio Pro. 
uh, and we were with them for a couple of years. And again, the big you know, thesis for us where we see the longest watch times is all of our HLS channels, our fast channels, we actually cycle into our own EPG, but Dot Studio Pro didn't have a solution for that. So we ended up with Brightcove Beacon, which we're very close with. And we actually helped to archetype um, that product back in 2019, which then we launched in 2020. So that's our owned and operated. And then as our fast play out, we use Frequency and Whirl. We don't use Amagi. Um, um, those are our two preferred vendors, but everything originates at frequency and kind of to LaShawn, Deshauna's point, you know, it, it's, you know, it's been a tough thing to navigate. So in 2017, we started a mastermind group of other new streaming services. Totally. It's not like an official group. It was just a think tank. And this group now has a Slack channel of about like 35 folks ranging from Quelly to Reverie to Pongolo, which is now VIX, which is now Univision, um, you know, to Tastemade, to all the different AVOD, SVOD players. And we just, you know, compare and contrast notes back and forth. And it's a great way to have our own community, uh, you know, just wow. within navigating uh, the entire how system. How much do you have to pay to get on that? We don't charge anything. We're not like an OTTX. We're not like, a, you know, we're not a business organization. <laughs> we're like literally, and no shade to them, but like we, you know, it, th there's two rules to join the group. You have to sign the master NDA. The, all of the group has to agree um, to have you in the group and you can't be competitive to somebody in the group. So then it feels like a safe space for us to exchange information to help each other grow. Um, and everyone has, a, I don't think there's a single person in that group who has not accelerated their business in the like two or three years that we've had this going on. Amazing. And how many years have you been doing this? How many years? Since 2017, we actually started the group in 2017. Wow. I actually was going to like pitch events and I had friends who were pitching di like different services and different verticals. And I'm like, we should just get dinner or like go to someone's boardroom and get pizza and beer. That evolved obviously during the pandemic to like a nationwide Zoom group, uh, which we are you know still doing. But the Slack channel has been the biggest asset, I think. Amazing. You know, uh, to Amazing. Point. Well, and yeah. by the way, um, uh, you, you know, and I want to get to Paul in just a second, but I, I'm going to ask you first. I um, I was going to mention that, uh, of course, Televisa Univision uh, just launched uh, something, uh, I think, uh, yesterday or uh, so. Uh, and I think you, you you had alluded to them, Damien. So um, really, um, you know, as, as if we blink, we're going to miss uh, some new channel launching. And I don't mean to say that they are necessarily niche, but uh, Ajit, let's get down to you. What tech challenges have you mentioned, of course, you alluded to where you've gone. I mean, essentially in India from 2G to 5G and um, shout out, I guess, to the Ambani brothers and Geo. But, uh, but let's talk about your tech challenges. So for us, uh, one of the things was speed was of essence. So we had the option of building on our own tech platform, but that would have taken us two to three years. And uh, so we, we partner with a company called First Light, which is an American Canadian company. These were the guys who actually had set up quick play until it was taken over by AT&T. And then they went out again and set up first light. So they have their own cloud native platforms. And uh, we're very happy with them. We get the speed and the kind of agility that we need. And uh, I think uh, the challenges remain because in smaller towns and markets, while the, uh, the, the connections are there and people are using mobiles, the speeds are not as good. So one of the big things we had to take care of uh, on AHA was to make sure that even if you had low speed bandwidth internet or through the, your mobiles, it could play. And that's something we managed to achieve. So we're very happy with our partners. And of course they work with Google and Akamai and all of the others. And, and I would just add, uh, you know, it's a pretty common use case for a lot of our customers, especially in markets where there are bandwidth restrictions, right? They're always looking to you, know, you, you still want to present good, high quality content, uh, but the challenges are you have to support this you know, proliferation of new devices. Um, a lot of the devices in the market now are new smart TVs and they're smart TVs that are built on sort of you know, outdated chipsets, right? They're, they're cheaper for that reason. Um, and so you need to really compress the video. You have to do a lot more work up front in your content workflow. Uh, in order to present really good quality, but you know, at low bandwidth, uh, with the low bandwidth constraints to the end users. So we see that a lot um, in our uh, Asia Pacific markets. We see it a lot in Latin America, uh, really any market that's uh, constrained for bandwidth. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that overview. And, and also, 
Ajit, thanks for mentioning first slide. Uh, I've, I've done some stuff with Paul Pastor in the past, and it's, it's great to, to hear more about what they're doing there. Uh, Paul Erickson, speaking of Paul's, um, so Antenna released some uh, data uh, that got a lot of attention a couple of weeks ago when they basically said that uh, they found that 50% of people who subscribe to premium services like a Disney Plus or uh, um, even Netflix uh, for a hit were basically gone within six months. So this incredible churn that's happening. I don't dare, uh, dare say that, 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 that that's a, an issue at all with niche services, but what's your take on that and you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what Antenna has shown and what we're talking about here uh, on this panel? Well, I would say, you know, from the stat you saw that I presented earlier, it's pretty close to that, right? I mean, except our, ours is based on uh, uh, people that have left the service in the prior 12 months. And I guess the, the main takeaway is that it, it's risen. No matter whose stats you look at, uh, churn has risen compared to a year ago and two years ago. And to me, uh, there's two things there. One, churn is always going to be higher with OTT services. So you can't really look at it on the same scale that you look at traditional pay TV's churn level. They really don't compare because OTT, uh, by its very nature, it's easy to get in and it's easy to get out. And the ease of that is uh, part of what appeals so greatly to the every person. And so it's inherently going to carry a higher level of churn. And, and if you think about it, the faster the competitive velocity or the higher the competitive velocity, pick your analogy, um, the, the, the higher the churn is going to tweak upward a little bit, right? With better offers, more uh, richer content being showcased. Uh, more options, what have you, people are going to experiment. Now with niche services, I think that there's unique opportunity there because uh, for a lot of people, they wanted to experiment and see if the grass is greener and try out other services, but niche services serve a very specific audience with specific needs, right? They, they, they're looking for something that can usually only be served in a focused way by a niche service. So I don't know that the normal rules of churn necessarily apply to a niche service, as you alluded to, Chris. Um, but I do think that in this environment, especially over this next year, two years, as people come out of the, let's say, necessitated uh, subscribership to multiple services over the pandemic, watching as much as they could get their hands on. Uh, and as that, some of that kind of falls away, people are going to get pickier about what they buy or what they subscribe to every month. And sure, one of those things is gonna be a, a must have, a Netflix, uh, or sorry, it's a door about going off there. A Netflix, a Prime Video, Hulu, what have you. But then how else are they gonna round out that streaming budget every month? Probably they're gonna slot in one or two things that they really like, whether that's Taste Made, UFC, Fight Pass, you name it. The, the great thing about OTT is it enables people to get exactly what they want to round out you yep, know, something exactly. that they get for themselves and their kids, and, and but what, they can what, also serve their own interests. Right, and OTT is going to the dog, so we'll have you go on mute now. Thank you for that. Um, right. Totally. So, 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 uh, you know, that's a good pivot to my next question, which is, uh, what's the path to profitability for niche content channels today? Uh, do we see a greater margin than mainstream channels might have? Uh, Mark, let's start with you on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, for us, it was it was really the the biggest cost was was creating this curated uh, content offering. Uh, because again, it's, you know, we have this, we have a social network. That's the most important thing is, is the, the artists, the musicians coming onto the channel. That's what makes the interactivity valuable and desirable. And, um, so that's how we solved that problem was by paying the artists, you know, a fair wage, even, even a generous wage, um, as opposed to doing something that, that was, um, usage-based or rev share, which is, which is what a Spotify, uh, has done, but it, but it, it frankly, I think, undervalues the contribution of the creators, and that that isn't really what what we were about, even though it creates equity value. Um, so, so that was really, um, you know, the the most significant cost that we have was sort of a subsidy, if you will, the way the way Netflix paid to get high quality content on their service initially. Um, but I do think our, you know, the good news is that not, none of the services on this on this um, uh, on this seminar are competing for you know blockbuster content and we're not competing with each other for content at all because we're in different niches but we, but we don't need blockbuster or superstar content um, we need high quality content from from well-known artists with uh, with substantial followings Our artists have followings collectively that are in the millions and millions of users 
And again, the community aspect, the context around that content is important for us because we're not competing solely on the basis of the content, but also the context and community. So I do think, um, you know, once we hit break even, we have a lot of operating leverage and our margins will be, uh, will be way better than, than, you know, one of these, you know, services that are, that are hitting each other over the head in, in the streaming wars. Yeah, exactly. And Damien, what's your take on that? Yeah, so, you know, for us, I'm I'm not aware of what the margins are for the mainstream, but we're typically averaging anywhere between a 35 and 50% margin overall. So we're doing pretty good. I'd like to, you know, like to think those are decent margins. Anything over 30% is a decent margin. And a lot of that I think is due to the fact that again, there's only one place uh, for, you know, our consumer from a B2B side is the advertiser. There's only one place for an advertiser to hit this audience at scale. We own the largest amount of video ad inventory period globally for LGBTQ consumers. Um, and that's why we're servicing folks like McDonald's and Diesel and Lexus. Um, and I think that, you know, that is just going to grow. You know, our CPMs range on direct sales between 35 and $50, which is kind of crazy when you look at the averages being between like 15 and 20, let's say yeah. on a good day, if you're on a mainstream yeah. aggregator. Um, but it's because we're differentiated, we're niche, we can service at scale, and we also can package you into branded content. Totally. That's great. Now, now we're going to move to, we have a couple of questions here uh, before we wrap, because we're going to, we're, we're pretty close to the end here. Tim Barden asks, what about the niche of local content creation, distribution, monetization, similar to the local programming regional TV broadcasting uh, produced during the advent of broadcast before networks took over. I think uh, I, I get this. I, I do like the question. Anyone want to take that? Okay. Well, I, I, I can say that I think uh, this is something that needs to be addressed because, of course, once upon a time, uh, we had, you know, some great local programming. Uh, I grew up here in New York, uh, in the Bay Area there was, and that was syndicated or not. So uh, we'll uh, just put that out there in the ether for anyone who's watching who wants to uh again on Damien's Slack channel and talk about it. Uh, <laughs> well, Chris, to answer that question, actually, there already is local programming. You know, Sinclair aggregated all of the local news channels Correct. into the third product. Um, right. You know, Numo's doing that with Comcast. You know, we're already starting to see that happen. Now, if you're talking about like your local PBS station, that is something totally yeah, different. Yeah, I think, yeah, maybe, but I think there's something slightly yeah. different. The idea of having, whether it was a local ch children's show or something that was even, you know, uh, an episodic, um, or, or something that that's, that's more, uh, right. docu specific. Um, but, uh, so Tim Barden, uh, uh, that will put a pin in that one because it's a good question. Um, but now Ken Silverman has one for Ajit, uh, can Ajit please speak a bit more about the content that AHA provides and plans for expansion outside of India? What do you think, Ajit? Oh. Uh, interesting question within the right in the middle of it, and I was going to connect that to the monetization question. Uh, so I'll I'll just quickly get to that. So I think uh, pretty much like Damien and Mark were talking about, uh, I think uh, our ability to on subscriptions to get to what the mainstream players are charging for just one language is limited, and subscriptions will never cover our costs. And we've been in the middle of you know brainstorming on what more can we do. Uh, we know that uh, SWOT is just 10% of the total base of people watching video content. So we are definitely looking at advertising uh, and giving a lower cost version of the service where we put ads. We are looking at exactly like your McDonald's partnerships. We've got brands coming to us saying the way we uniquely engage with this language audience. So we've got like uh, we right now doing two nonfiction shows where we have four to five brands without any ads who are paying for advertiser funded programming in that module. And the third one is that the footprint of, uh, to come back to the question you asked, the footprint of each one of the languages around the world is significant. And their ability to pay for this group of NRIs in Telugu and Tamil is also higher than the average uh, uh, Telugu in India. And uh, we started a pilot uh, last year in the US where we took AHA to the US uh, Telugu NRI market. And we've seen significant, so just to give you a sense of the numbers, there are about 120,000 120, households with Telugu speaking households in the US. And we started uh, really marketing to them and uh, building a community uh, connect with them. And as of today, we have about 80,000 subscribers coming just from the US Telugu community. That's uh, great. With, with That's Tamil, great. Which is more spread over Southeast Asia and uh, Middle East. 
uh, we intend to go there. And we're not mm -hmm. stopping at just uh, marketing to them. We are trying to build community connects. We are taking live concerts of their favorite uh, you know, musicians and actors there. And we've just made our first content, which was fully, completely shot, produced actors all from America. And it was called the American Dream, which we premiered on New Year's Eve. Uh, Fantastic. So thank you for the question. It's something that we're looking I, I, at. You know, that this is, for, for those uh, who couldn't make this panel, it will be on demand. Uh, 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 please uh, uh, tell them to watch Ajit's answer if you're interested in what AHA is doing. We've got a wrap, so I'm sorry to say, uh, but this has been amazing. So just quickly, thanks again to Damien Pellicchioni from Reverie, Mark DiLorenzo from Together, to Shona Spencer from Quelly TV, Paul Erickson and his dog from Parks Associates, our sponsor, Igor Oroper from Bitmovin, and of course, Ajit Thacker from AHA. And back to you, Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. And thank you so much, Chris Paff. That was terrific, as always, when Chris moderates a panel and when we get a bunch like this together. I'm looking forward to seeing Chris and Damien for sure in Boston. I hope a couple or more of you um, for Streaming Media East and uh, our next panel. Oh, I have to give away an Amazon gift card, don't I? I have to spin the wheel and come up Jeff Torgerson. Jeff Torgerson, you have won the Amazon gift card. Watch out for an email about that. We will be back in just over 30 minutes. When we talk about measurement, data, analytics, measuring what counts for OTT delivery. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.